Hello friends! Welcome to the end of the Romantic Era. This has been a lot of music, and even with what all we've covered and are going to cover today, we're only scratching the surface. This was just an incredibly prolific period of music, and there's so much more I wish you could listen to and hear, um, but this is where we have to end today. Um, there is some stuff that we're going to cover next week that could be considered late Romantic. It's Impressionism uh, or Neoclassical shows up in the very late 19th or early 20th century, um, but uh, you won't need to include that on your program. Um, we're going to look at people like Debussy and Holst and Stravinsky next week, along with um, jazz and um, uh, rock and roll and other 20th century music. Um, I, would, I will need you to watch the videos next week. However, you won't be required to take the quiz on them. The quiz will be extra credit, um, so if you want to take it, if you've missed some questions on these other quizzes and you want to boost your score, the quiz is extra credit. However, uh, let me throw in a little caveat in that. It will be a pass-fail quiz, so you need to be really familiar with what I cover next week, and it's gonna, the questions are going to be a little bit harder um, because, again, I'm offering this completely for extra credit. Uh, if you need it, please do it. If you don't, skip it. It's okay. But do watch the videos next week because there's some great music to watch and listen to. But again, you won't be quizzed over it. You won't be required to take the quiz. Okay, with that being said, let's go into the, let's finish up the Romantic era. So a couple leading French composers from this time, um, Cesar Franck and Gabriel Fauré. Uh, Franck was born in Belgium, but he came to Paris to study and he taught organ. And he was a composer of instrumental and vocal music. And his works, they blended both the classical forms of Bach with more modern approaches of taking a theme and transforming it throughout, uh, not unlike what Liszt and Wagner would do. You have this theme, and whatever the drama or whatever you're trying to portray, you modify the theme to express what you want to do. He obviously used a lot more chromaticism. Remember, chromaticism is where we add extra accidentals, so we're moving in half steps. Da, 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 da. Um, you're going to see a lot more of that. It's a much more modern tonal palette than what Bach would have used, but he still was able to write in the style of Bach using this modern, uh, this modern technique. And what I'd like you to listen to is just a little bit of the fugue section of his Prelude Chorale and Fugue work. Um, the first video, it's all the Prelude and Chorale and Fugue all together. So if you want to just start at the Fugue, you'll have to scroll to 1040. Uh, 10 minutes 40 seconds into the video, but you'll be able to see the score. Otherwise, the second video is just the fugue, but it doesn't have a score to follow. Um, so you'll see how the fugue works. There's the subject, there's the answer, there's a counter subject, so forth and so forth, just like what we talked about before, but with a much more modern sound, very chromatic, a little more dissonant, um, probably would have made Bach like a little bit uncomfortable because it broke a lot of the tonal harmony rules from his era. Um, but it's really cool because it's a very modern take on a very old style of music. So I'd like you to take a listen to Franck's Fugue from his Prelude, Chorale, and Fugue. Now our other leading composer we need to mention um, is Gabriel Fauré. Uh, he was more like a modern Mendelssohn um, for the French. He abstained from the showy virtuosic writing that his contemporaries were subscribing to. And he chose to focus on much more simple lyrical music. He wrote a requiem, which is phenomenal and worth listening to. He wrote some opera, but he mostly wrote piano music. And his later style involved shorter, more fragmented melodies. So these are like little chunks, da 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 da, and then da 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 da, da and then da 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 da, um, that were very unique. But um, to get through all his strange harmonies, very chromatic again he'd use what's called a common tone. So I've got a little piano on my phone here and I'm gonna demonstrate what I mean by that. So let's say I play a C minor chord. That's C, E flat, and G. And the next chord I wanna use is E flat major, which isn't really related to the key that I'm in, but both of those chords use an E flat. Kinda sounds a little funky, but it fits because they both use a common tone. Or we could write, let's write with a diminished chord. So C, E flat, G flat. And then let's just take this, uh, let's just take the C and we'll do it in first inversion. So you still have a C that they're both sharing. Um, sorry, that was second inversion. Uh, but um, 
anyways, that's how he would make these harmonies work, which you can see in this piece that I'd like you to listen to. Avant que tu ne t'en allais, and I, uh, allais. I may have mis, I, not may, I probably mispronounced quite a bit of that because French. Um, but you're going to hear these contrasting short sections, and if you follow the harmony, you'll see that the chords, while they might not make a lot of sense for a traditional harmonic progression, um, you're going to see that they at least share one note going from one chord to the next. I need to start over here so you can see. From one chord to the next. And uh, that way, uh, there was at least some relation, and he was able to make this chromaticism and all these extra accidentals work. So take a listen to this short piece. There's so many other works I'd encourage you to explore by Fauré or Franck, uh, particularly if you like organ music, listen to more Franck stuff. Uh, or Fauré, he wrote some other beautiful lyrical pieces and piano pieces, such as his Pavan, which we've done an arrangement of in West Winds. Uh, there's the works of Satie or Sasson, um, such as Satie's Gymnopedes or Sasson's Carnival of the Animals, which we did some of, we did Aquarium from it last year with handbells. You can also look up Bizet and his work, including his opera Carmen, uh, with the very famous Habanera tune. That business. That's, uh, there's so much good music that we're just having to skip over right now. But we're going to turn over to Bohemia, uh, which is part of modern day Czech, the Czech Republic. Um, and we're going to look, we're going to gloss over Smetna. We are going to look at one important composer from there, Antonin Dvorak. Uh, and yes, it is spelled D-V-O-R-A-K. And you get Dvorak. Anyways, um, he wrote symphonies, concertos, dances, and other works. Um, he also conducted at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago uh, because he was working in the United States by then. He would use traditional dance rhythms and folk-like melodies from his homeland uh, with contemporary writing practices. Um, and though he wouldn't directly quote folk music, um, people got the point that he was referencing his homeland. And folk music, which we haven't talked about, but you should know what the term means, Folk music refers to tunes native to a given region, um, often handed down orally, um, but uh, they're tunes that are very associated with that given country. They're, they're simple tunes or melodies that um, just evoke feelings of that nation, and they're specific to that nation. So composers, um, we haven't talked about this a lot, but composers to get a sense of nationalism and pride in their pieces would often quote these kinds of tunes. Um, there's two examples of Dvorak's work that I want you to listen to that evoke this nationalism. Um, one of them is his Slavonic Dance Number no. 8 from his Slavonic Dances, which is also a piece we've done a transcription of in West Winds, but it was originally written as a piano duet or for orchestra. Um, I want you to listen to Number no. 8, at least the start of it. A uh, lot of fun. See if you can figure out the form that's going on here. Do you hear sections that repeat? The other one I want you to listen to is his Symphony Number no. 9 from the New World. I want you to listen to the beginning of that. Um, the, the, uh, the thing about the New World Symphony is when it was written, this isn't about Bohemia, this is about the United States, because like I mentioned, Dvorak was working in the United States later on. He was working as an artistic director at the National Conservatory of Music in New York. And the New World Symphony was his attempt of creating a nationalistic sound for the United States. And he got his inspiration from the music of Native Americans and African Americans, including spirituals. And this was his take on it. Um, spirituals, of course, are African American religious songs that are passed down um, orally by uh, in the slave tradition. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. So I'd like you to take a listen to Slavonic Dances number eight. Uh, I've got the piano version up. And I'd like you to listen to this, uh, at least some of this movement I have pulled up for you from the New World Symphony 9 by Dvorak. So take a listen. Now, I wish we had time to talk about this guy, but I mention him just because he's one of my favorite composers from the era, Edvard Grieg, uh, Norwegian, not related to Einstein in spite of appearances. Um, some of his well-known works you probably know, the Holberg Suite and his Peer Gint Suite of pieces. Many of you probably know a lot of the tunes from his Peer Gint Suite, very programmatic music. Um, You've got morning, da 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 so there's that. There's Anitra's dance, da 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 There's that one, and then there's, of course, In the Hall of the Mountain King. Dun 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 This is all from the Pier Gint Suite. It's just a really fabulous set of music. So, um, it's not required, but I'd really, what I think would be fun, 
Don't listen to it in entirety if you don't have time, but maybe go through the Pier Gint Suite. It's not on your playlist, but look it up and see how many of the tunes from there you recognize. You may recognize more than you think. All right, so next week we'll talk about um, Gustav Holst and his band music for Britain, but right now we need to talk about music in America and bands and John Philip Sousa, uh, for whom our Westerns Award is named. So, um, the 19th century, obviously we know there was a lot of immigration to the United States. A lot of people from Europe and other places were coming over, and as the Germans came over in particular, they helped shape our taste towards classical European music, and they helped professionalize a lot of our orchestras, so we're grateful for that. Um, this was still a man's world as far as music goes, in spite of what Fanny Hensel, Mendelssohn's sister, and Clara Schumann had contributed, but there was one American composer who stood out, Amy Beach, and while she was barred from studying music at professional music schools, she did study piano, harmony, counterpoint, and here's the cool part, and other composers have done this too, which we talked about a little bit. She taught herself to compose by studying the works of musicians that she loves. So those of you that love composing, get on IMSLP uh, or wherever and look up music by composers that you like. Look at how they make it work and then imitate them. It's a great way to teach yourself composition. Um, she was one of the few women composers to write large-scale works in this era, including her Gaelic Symphony and her Piano Concerto. Um, but the big thing we need to talk about in American Britain is the rise of the band or the wind symphony. So there's no strings. It's just all brass and woodwinds and percussion. Um, this comes from a military background, particularly the Civil War, when almost every unit had a band, which was for entertainment and morale. Um, and when the war ended, those band players went back to their communities and a lot of them got community bands started. Uh, Patrick Gilmore, famous band director, uh, along with John Philip Sousa, who helped raise the prestige level of bands. They would take their bands not just across the states, but to Europe as well, which uh, kind of made them our first major, major musical export. Um, Gilmore at one point got to lead a huge thousand member band and a 10,000 member chorus at the National Peace Jubilee in Boston. Um, Sousa, on the other hand, he was in charge of the United States Marine Band for years and brought them to great prominence before he started his own band. And he did a lot of writing. He wrote a lot of band music and marches. Band music um, consisted of marches, transcriptions of orchestra works, and other dances and arrangements. But a march, what it is, it's a very rhythmic piece in two or four, so it's gonna be even, one, two, or one, two, three, four. It's not gonna be one, two, three, that's a waltz. We aren't doing that here. Um, and so you've got that, you've got these repeated sections or periods, remember that, musical phrases, which we now call strains. Um, and so you've got going on, you've got an A and a B usually, that's the first, first set of strains, and that's the march part. Then you've got a second part called trio, uh, again, two strains there. And then you've got the, the return of the, the first half again, A and B. So it's kind of like, it's almost like a more complex ternary, um, but uh, Sousa, because he also was having his bands just give concerts and not just marching down the street, he wanted to build more of a climax at the end, so he came up with a new form. Um, and it's got that A and B march part again, both sections repeated. Then you've got the C part, which is the trio, which is more lyrical. But then you've got a break strain, which is just like a, an interruption of that. And then you go back and build the C again, building to a climax, so you don't repeat the A and the B again. Um, and this is how the Stars and Stripes Forever is laid out, which is one of Seuss's most well-known marches, and it's the National March for the United States. Um, so the form is outlined up here on the screen. It's a short piece. It goes by pretty quick. You can skip past the narrator's introduction to the piece if you'd like, although I encourage you to listen to it and see if you can identify this form and enjoy, and then come back. Okay, all right. Last thing we need to talk about, uh, spirituals, which we mentioned earlier. Again, religious African-American slave songs passed down by oral tradition. Um, but there's some distinct elements that influence spirituals and other African-American forms of music, um, which are going to influence some of our later genres of music, such as ragtime, rhythm and blues, or jazz. And these are some identifying features. You won't hear these in every spiritual. In fact, the last one you're not going to hear in many spirituals at all. But these are some identifying features um, that came to us from Africa, brought over by these slaves, and then slowly influenced our music here. 
Um, you've got call and response. You'll definitely hear this in spirituals. This is where there's a leader. He'll sing something. Hey, and everybody else will echo. Hey, all the choir. Um, you've got improvisation, which of course means that you're going to be, um, it's going to be a little different every time you do it. You're shaking things up. You're changing it a little bit. Um, you've got syncopation, which is emphasizing weak beats. One and two and three and four and one and two. You've got short phrases that are repeated. You've got multiple layers of rhythm, some clapping going on with one person, stomping with the other, you know, different layers of rhythm. You've got bending of pitch. This is very jazz. Hey, just, you know, flatten it, sliding a little bit. Um, it's called a blues note in jazz when you're a little bit flat. Um, you've got moans and shouts. And then the banjo is actually based off a West African string instrument. We associate it with Appalachian music often, but it's actually based off a West African string instrument. So what I want you to listen to uh, really quick, at least the beginning of it, an example of a spiritual from this era, Go Down Moses, which any of you that were in choir last year, you know this. Um, this arrangement here is sung by the Fisk Jubilee Singers, and Fisk University is, a, is one of the early... Uh, African-American universities founded here in the United States and it's in Nashville, Tennessee. I want you to take a listen and this is actually the Fisk Jubilee Singers here circa about 1870. Uh, take a listen at least to a little bit of them singing Go Down Moses and then um, I'll see you in the 20th century next week. Again you do need to watch the videos next week but uh, the quiz is only for extra credit next week so awesome. All right enjoy!